queue. And uh, of course, uh, there are, there are, I think they, they, they'll need a uh, little applause or if you want a big applause because without these guys, we don't have any, any budget you know, to organize something like this. So please give it a big applause for all of them. Thank you. So there are too many. But, well, I will try only to, to uh, talk about a little bit about where we are and uh, what we are doing here. And as you, as you will find, everything here, I think, is in, in your baggage, in your... Yeah. Uh, so actually, this is a big map, but I think it's not too big to, to see here. We are in the auditorium, but after all, we will move to another buildings. So don't worry about that. Uh, we will move with you, so don't worry. And uh, we are going, after all, to the coffee break, so we will have time enough to move to another place. But again, you have a map in your bag, so don't worry about this. It's not too far, it's not too difficult to move, and I think we'll, you will find everything pretty, pretty fine. And uh, yeah, so some info about the conference. We found actually 220 people, uh, more than 40 speakers, and people coming from all over Europe. For us, it's a great pleasure to receive people from United Kingdom, Germany, Portugal, Romania, Poland, France, Belgium, Denmark, Holland, and even people from Spain. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. And we are pretty, pretty, I don't know how to say, but we are really glad to receive all of you. So thank you for coming again. And uh, yeah, we have uh, some information about the Twitter, the hashtag. As I said, always is, is free, so try to use it. Uh, again, we will receive some, some feedback, some ideas. And there is some information about the Wi-Fi is free. And you have all this information also in your baggage, so don't worry about this. And actually, another interesting point is that you will see uh, in, the, in the other rooms uh, some kind of smiles. These smiles are for, for the feedback. So try to, when you leave your room, try to pick up your, your well, what, what kind of uh, interest or what do you think about the, the type of the talk, and then bring it with, uh, with another bag. And it will be fun for, for all, all of us to understand what kind of talk do you like more or what not, and why. And uh, yeah, uh, only a few words about what, what's this about the Barcelona Java user group, because we are three guys that you will see. Uh, Adela, where are you? Yeah. Adela, Jonathan, and myself, uh, Nacho. We are three guys interested in Java and, and technology, so, uh, well, that's, that's pretty, pretty much what, what I need to say. And, uh, well, not too much, but we are an open community, so actually uh, a non-profit organization. And we started about three years ago, uh, you know, five, five guys drinking a beer and talking about what can we say about, oh, I work with the Spring, and well, what shit is this? And, Something like this. And right now we are about 500 people in the meetup, so I think we are doing something better or something good. And well, we are pretty proud of this. And a few words about which kind of talks we, we make. We make a different kind of, uh, depending on the technology or, or, or framework or cloud system or whatever. And uh, yeah, we have a few photos. I suppose that some guys will see that they are here inside. Do not worry, we have a copyright of all of them. And uh, yeah, I think we are pretty interested about how many people we can bring. So, and actually, about the resume is about 40 events in the last two years plus this conference, and two live events in well, each month. Sorry, and we also started one monthly online event in our YouTube channel. And we are only three guys. I don't understand how we can do this. And of course, again, we like to thank you all of you because, uh, as I said, uh, the first is. All of this, thank, uh, thanks to you. And I think I'm finishing right now, and I would like to say hola to all of the people that comes from all the countries. This is my daughter. This is awesome. <laughs> this is my little princess. And uh, yeah, I will only say to say hello, welcome to the Java Barcelona conference. And I would like to say thank you again, and a big applause for the Dean of the schools of university that will come here now? Okay, so a little applause please to the Dean of the school. Okay, so, well, uh, just 
just a few words. Uh, I'm Nuria Castell, I'm the dean of the School of Informatics at UBC. And uh, we are really very, very proud to, to welcome this, this conference, this first conference in, in Barcelona in Spain. And the first thing I would like to say is congratulate to these three guys that started a very nice history. And, and uh, that uh, who knows where they will arrive. Of course, with uh, the help of all the presence and a lot of people that is uh, now contributing to this uh, Java Jazzer group. So uh, the second uh, question, of course, is uh, welcome everybody, especially the, the speakers that uh, are uh, uh, helping to, to have a nice conference. And uh, I, I would like to just uh, tell you that I hope that you enjoy these two days in, uh, in this campus. Uh, there is uh, some building that is, as uh, Nacho said, is, is really, is in really uh, nice and fast and easy to, to locate all the, all the places. So, and I'm sure they will be uh, very, very helpful to <laughs> with everybody. So I'm sure that nobody will get lost in this campus. And uh, enjoy the city. As I uh, said, there is a lot of people out of Barcelona. So uh, enjoy the, the city. The weather we have prepared for you, it's really, really hot. I'm sorry. That <laughs> but uh, well, it's something that you normally expect in, in, in Barcelona by this, uh, by this uh, time. So uh, enjoy the, the conference. I'm sure that uh, with the energy that these uh, people from Java Jose Group has put in this conference, everything will be OK. And we are happy to, to be helping in this, in this conference uh, as much as we can. So uh, uh, enjoy the city. And I expect that you get a lot of smiling uh, faces at the end of the conference. So, have a nice uh, two days conference and, uh, and be happy. <laughs> So Kubernetes, I think, is Kubernetes and Docker, two of the biggest things that have been in IT in the last decade. They're, they're both really, really amazing things that, in many ways, change what it even means to deliver and build and release software. So I, I hope by the end of this talk, you'll at least have a vague idea of what Kubernetes is. I hope I'll convince you to try it, um, and at least that I, I think it changes everything, quite frankly, Kubernetes and Docker. So, anyways, let me get started. Um, now, one thing we're all struggling with is this question, how, how can we deliver more value to our customers um, faster, despite software getting bigger, more complicated, more moving pieces, more devices to support, more form factors, everybody wants high availability in three data centers, everything has to be cached in real time and asynchronous and reactive, and everything's getting harder and harder and bigger and bigger, but at the same time, we all want to go faster and faster and faster, right? We have to go faster to stay competitive because all of our Competitors are going faster and faster. So we have these two problems. Everything's getting bigger and more complicated, and we need to go faster. So there's this movement called, generally called DevOps. You might have heard of the microservices movement as well. They're kind of related, they're kind of the same thing, which is really all about how can we develop the software faster. And it's not just writing the software, it's writing the software, packaging the software, releasing the software, testing the software, rolling it into production. How can we go quicker and quicker? Now, I could talk for several hours about the whole DevOps microservices thing. I'm just going to briefly mention it. Um, one of the main ways to go faster, uh, the mythical man mode, if you've ever read that book, it's an old book like 20 years ago. If you have a large team that's going slowly and you add more people to the team, it goes slower because the more people you add to a team, the more communication overhead and everything just gets slower and slower. So the bigger a monolith of software you have, the slower it gets. So the only real way of going faster is federate. You federate your software into lots of little pieces, and you federate your teams into lots of little teams. So the way to go faster is to federate, right? To give you a couple of examples, the internet is a big federated system. It's not a big monolith, right? We don't say, we're releasing the internet next week. Everyone log off, just we're going to shut down the internet, we're going to reboot it again tomorrow, right? The internet is a federated system. It's been little bits of it that are being released all the time. Right? 
Um, the open source uh, ecosystem is a federated system, right? There's no, thankfully, there's not one open source project that we all contribute to. Imagine the mailing list on that. Um, but no, there's millions of open source projects, right? Every day there's millions of developers working on millions of projects. And it scales because it's federated. There's lots of small pieces which are all independently releasing and so on and so forth. So to go faster, we need to federate all, all of our software into lots of pieces and release them independently as quickly as we can. Uh, another part of the DevOps movement is cattle, not pets. In other words, if you have to manually install a server by hand and you give it like a name, like a pet, and you name your server and you manually install everything, that's kind of not good, right? You want cattle where you can just kind of shoot it. If it's kind of not looking right, you just shoot it. It's just cattle. So the cattle versus pets thing is about immutable infrastructure, right? Have an immutable image so that you can just boot up a server whenever you need it, on any machine, anywhere, any data center, whatever, right? So immutable infrastructure is a, is a new movement. Um, and basically automate everything, right? If you want to go faster, don't manually release things. Don't manually test everything. Don't manually copy a war into a Tomcat folder in production, right? Just automate everything. So these kind of three main things means, generally speaking, we're, we're making a lot, we're increasingly making more and more releases than and more and more things, right? Um, and to do a release well, okay, if you're lucky, you might be making like one Java war, and you might have one Tomcat server, like you might have a really nice simple system, and to do a release, you might just take down the Tomcat and change the war and bring it back up again. To do it slightly better, what you might want to do is have two Tomcats, and you bring up the new war in another Tomcat, and your load balancer kind of fails over to it. But as soon as you start having many Tomcats and many different apps, the actual act of doing a release gets kind of tricky, because you kind of want to do things like rolling upgrades, where you generally roll traffic to the new version, see if it's okay, and if it's okay, then you totally roll forward or roll back. So even in an apparently hollow worldly kind of app, you kind of want tools to help you do releases and manage software. So this is where the Kubernetes kit comes in. I'll talk about that in a second. First, I want to talk about Docker. Now, pretty much anybody who works in software, any uh, cloud vendor, any middleware vendor, has probably talked a lot to you about Docker at some point. Everybody says Docker in any, any of the sentences. So I've already said Docker quite a few times already. I apologize. So, so Docker is a really big thing. What, what is Docker? Um, Docker is basically a way of packaging software. That's really all, all it's about. It's about putting software in a box. For me, one of the nicest things about Docker is the metaphor of shipping containers. So Docker is very much about, um, in, in the area of transportation, people used to transport any old random container, box, uh, barrel, package, whatever, right? And then the shipping industry and the travel industry realized, the transportation industry realized, if you have a standard shipping container, then every ship, well, firstly, they're all the same size, so they pack really well onto a ship, onto a truck, onto a train, onto a harbor, and then you can get standardized tools like cranes and stuff to like deal with this standard size. So having a standard box to put things in means all of your tools and infrastructure can deal with this standard box, right? Docker's kind of like that for software. It's a standard container box that you put software inside. So you can put something in the box. You as a developer can put some Java in there, some Perl, some PHP, whatever, look yourself out. Put something in the box. You can give it to someone. And so long as they can deal with Docker, they can take any software. So the act of releasing and provisioning some software, it doesn't really matter what's in the box anymore. It doesn't matter if you don't know Perl, or you don't know PHP, or you don't know Erlang, or you don't know whatever it is in the box. You just deal with the box. So having this standard way of packaging software is huge, right? Um, so what is Docker in, in more concrete terms? Docker, it uses something in Linux called lightweight containers. And Docker feels like virtualization, but it's not really doing any virtualization. There's no hypervisor, there's no, uh, extra operating system running. A Docker container is literally a single Unix process, but it's using various isolation features of Linux lightweight containers in Linux, things like C groups and namespaces and, and uh, clever file systems and that kind of stuff. So it looks and feels like each container is in a VM, right? Each, each container, each process looks like it's in its own little Linux box and it can't see anything else. Um, it has its own file system. It looks like it's, it looks like a VM, but there's no cost. Right. When you use a VM, virtualization is kind of okay, but it's kind of smelly in, a, in another way. A, 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 virtual, a VM is basically an entire copy of the entire computer. So there's a full Linux in there, there's a full operating system, scheduler, device driver operating system, there's memory, there's disk, there's, there's the whole thing, right? With Docker, it's just the process. So if you put, say, MongoDB in a, a container, or you put Cassandra in a container, it's just the MongoDB process, or it's just the JVM running. 
but there's nothing else in there. So Docker is really, really lightweight. It's a really lightweight way of putting software in a box, and then anyone can run it on any machine. It's really, really simple. So it, it's basically, the, it's now the standard immutable packaging format for software, which is really good. Um, the images run everywhere. Um, another thing about Docker, if you've ever tried to install a VM before, uh, over a slightly slow Wi-Fi like I have at home. They're monstrous. They're like, you know, they could be 10 gigabytes just to install a one-line shell script or something, right? So the, a VM is, is typically huge. Why? Because it copies everything on the computer, right? Every bit of the file system, the memory, the registers. I mean, it's a whole copy of a computer, right? With Docker, you choose what, to, what goes in the box. So typically, it's just the binaries and the libraries you need to run your application. So typically, the images are small, Another thing Docker does, which is kind of cool, is an image in Docker is built in layers. This is all kind of implementation detail, and you don't really see this as a user, but an image is built in layers, and layers can be reusable and cached. So for example, let's say I make a Docker container with Java 7, and I put some Tomcat in there, and I put my war inside. Docker will typically make one layer for the Linux stuff, one layer for the JVM, one layer for Tomcat, and one layer for the war, and then if someone else uses the same, operating system, the same uh, JVM, the same Tomcat, it will just reuse those layers. So as you start using Docker more and more, the caching of layers, it, it becomes automatic. So you hardly ever have to download anything, so things start really quick. If you have downloaded the image already, <coughs> typically containers start up in a millisecond. I mean, it's really, really fast. So Docker is increasingly the packaging format for software. It's really simple, it's really easy. Uh, one of the problems we've always had with software, particularly if you move from company to company, and you say, hey, I've got this awesome software, why do you install it, like production? And then people go, ah, uh, so our operation guys here, this is how they choose to install things. And there's this magic shell script they wrote, and it's in Perl, and that's the only way anything gets to production, and you have to do this and do that. There's often these kind of weird ways that operations folks bless them have done over the years um, to provision software. With Docker, we now have a standardized way that you can just take a Docker container, you can run it on Amazon, you can run it on Google, you can run it on Azure, you can run it on Linux, uh, you can run it anywhere. So Docker's really, really helping us deliver software in an easy to use form. Um, there's no installer, there's none of that kind of horrible stuff. You don't have to run Chef and Puppet or Ansible or Salt and all that kind of magic code generation gunk. It's a binary immutable image that just boots up, which is a really, really good thing. Another, another couple of things about uh, Docker processes. These processes isolate so they can't see each other. So you, you, if you install, uh, I don't know, MongoDB and Cassandra, like, why you don't want to do that, but if you did that on the same machine, they don't in any way interact. You know, one can't override the other's file system, or they can't clash with ports or anything like that, right? So you could literally boot up 20 Tomcats on your laptop, and it all just boots up and works. You don't have to go into the directory of Tomcat and edit the config file to change the port number like you do on your laptop, because everything clashes, there's only one port 8080, right? Every container is isolated and gets its own range of ports. It's a really good thing. Okay, so that's Docker. It's basically the way of Putting software in a box, it's just a Linux process, there's no virtualization, it's just a simple packaging format. Um, and this is basically how you run stuff in Docker. Docker Docker's an executable, right? So you do Docker space run, space, command line arguments, that one minus IT does interactive terminal shell, and then capital P uh, exposes by default all of the ports to the host machine so you can get in there. And then the slightly weird syntax, my user slash my service. So my user is the my user ID, and then my service is the name of my container. And if you learn that one command line, you can now run any software, right? You could run MongoDB with that, you can run Cassandra with that, that's why I keep using those as examples. You could run ActiveMQ with that, you could run a PHP app with that. You don't have to mess with your path, you don't have to run any weird installers, you can basically run any software on any machine that has Linux, right? Nice and simple. Right, so that's Docker. Now I want to talk about Kubernetes, which is even cooler than that. Uh, so Docker's kind of cool, we have all these containers for running stuff, and we have all these machines to run things on. How do we kind of make sure all the containers are running and that they all talk to each other, right? And this is the problem that in IT we call this orchestrating containers, is the, is the phrase the industry is now using. In some ways I'm not that keen on that phrase, or orchestrating containers. It sounds like you're just kind of shuffling things around and not really doing very much. What Kubernetes really does is it, it turns a bunch of boxes into your own cloud. That's really more what it is. But before I delve into what Kubernetes is, I just want to mention the ecosystem around Kubernetes. Uh, so th there's a company called Project Atomic, which uh, is a Linux distribution based on Docker. Um, now, one of the issues with uh, Linux is 
there's lots of shared libraries in there, right? And so if you want to update, I don't know, libc or something that most things are using, by up upgrading one library, you know, installing one RPM, could completely break anything on the box, right? There's a risk there. So um, changing a Linux box is, is slightly scary, right? Because you could have lots and lots of things running, and you've basically got a global file system that you're sharing, and there's lots of shared libraries in Linux. And what Project Atomic does is it turns this kind of monolith in Linux into lots of microservices, or lots of individual pieces. So it's basically a tiny little host operating system, and then everything below is Docker containers. So that each piece of Linux, whatever it is, uh, can be uh, independently um, rolled forward or rolled back in terms of versions. So rather than doing global changes to entire Linux distribution, you can just roll forward a change to system D or a change to any piece of Linux. So it turns Linux into lots of small individually managed pieces, which means you can go faster, right? It means you can uh, iterate faster, use newer versions of new things in isolation rather than globally updating things. So that's kind of interesting. So there's Docker baked into Linux now. Um, there's, there's another couple of variants of this that, um, what's the, uh, Coros has got a similar thing, Ubuntu Snappy is kind of going in this direction. The other thing that's interesting is Project Atomic has Kubernetes baked in, which we'll talk about in a minute, what that is. Um, there's a platform as a service thing called OpenShift. Um, platform as a service, if you've never used it, is uh, a way to help you write code, commit Git source code into a repository for just, everything just to build and deploy for you. It's a way of, helping you speed up the, the time it takes from writing some code, committing it, to actually running it in the environment for you. Um, all of the platforms as a service implementations, Cloud Foundry and uh, Heroku and OpenShift, they've all internally been using Linux containers for quite some time. And one of the new things in OpenShift V3 is, rather than just using Linux containers, it's using Docker and Kubernetes. Um, now, before OpenShift V3, all of the platforms as services used to have plugins or build packs or basically uh, uh, bespoke plugins for specific platforms or services that were unique to it. One of the really nice things about OpenShift V3 now is Docker is the way of writing a plugin, right? If you want something to run on the PaaS, you package something as a Docker container. So any Docker container can run on any PaaS now, which is really, really nice. So if you package your stuff as Docker, it can work on any platform as a service, any infrastructure as a service, um, OpenStack, for example, is an open source infrastructure as a service. Like an open source cloud, right? Compute nodes, network disk, basically. That's got Docker baked in. So you can just take your Docker image and run it on OpenStack as well. Right, enough of the ecosystem. Oh, I should mention Google's cloud has got Kubernetes baked in as well. So we have the operating system, Linux has got Kubernetes and Docker baked in. We have um, infrastructure as a service like OpenStack has got it baked in. Cloud providers like Google has it baked in. And it's also pretty trivial to run Kubernetes on any machine you find. Now here's a quick slide of what Kubernetes looks like. Um, don't worry too much about any of what, what the boxes is. Basically Kubernetes is a small piece of software you run on a bunch of boxes. It's fairly small. Um, in OpenShift, for example, it's a single binary. Like it's one small binary. You download this binary and say OpenShift start, and that you're done. So it's a small piece of software that you run on every machine and you basically link your machines together to make a cloud, right? That's really what Kubernetes does. It turns a bunch of boxes into a cloud and it lets you run all of your stuff and keeps your stuff running. Um, now, what I hope to do today is really show you as, as, do, as Java developers, what do you need to know about for Kubernetes or how do you use Kubernetes to build cloud native applications? So I'll just walk through really all you need to know about Kubernetes. In many ways, you can think of Kubernetes as, as this magic stuff that just works, but you as a developer need to know these three things pods, replication controls, and services. Now before I dive into what these are, all three of these, from a developer's perspective, all three of these are just blobs of metadata. They're blobs of JSON or YAML, right? They're just a bit of metadata that you define, and you give it into Kubernetes, and it takes care of everything else, right? So you have Docker images, and you have these three blobs of JSON or YAML, right? That, which you, I'll show you what they look like in a second. So it's really, really simple. From a developer, all you need to worry about is putting stuff in Docker images, and these three blobs of JSON that I'll walk you through, and, and that's it. It's, it's, it's amazing, it really is. Okay, let me walk through it. So pods, um, so the Docker logo is a whale, and a pod is a group of whales, so it's kind of like a joke, a pod. But the, this is the Kubernetes term, pod, and it basically just refers to one or more Docker containers. Um, now you might think, why don't we just use the term container in Kubernetes? Well, the reason is, sometimes you want to co-locate co containers together on the same box, right? For example, um, the sidecar pattern is quite common. 
Um, you might want to run, uh, let me give you a good example that I'll demo in a second. You might want to run um, uh, Grafana, as, which is an application that shows metrics. So you might have a Docker container that just runs Grafana that visualizes metrics. And then Grafana needs some config files to, to configure the dashboards. So you can use an off-the-shelf Grafana container, and then you could use a sidecar container that loads the dashboards from, say, a Git repository and puts them on disk so that the other container can read them. So one of the nice things about pods is you can use pluggable containers that work together. If you put two containers in a pod, they can share disk. Right? So you have these isolated containers, but they can share a local, local file system. So one of the nice things about pods is you can group uh, containers together and make sure that they're deployed together on the same physical host. So they can talk direct to each other with local sockets, they can share volumes and share data and so on and so forth. So a pod is like a, con usually, to be honest, a pod is one container, but it's maybe <coughs> three. Uh, you might, for example, want to co-locate um, a Tomcat with a Redis server or Memcached with a Tomcat. So it's a way of saying, I want something on the same physical box as my container. Most of the time, I think we'll just have, most of us as Java people, um, a pod will just be a Docker container with a JDA inside. Really. But it gives you the option. A couple of other things about pods. A pod, you can configure environment variables to configure things. Um, a pod uh, typically exposes ports. Like if you're doing, say, Tomcat, you might expose port 8080 in the Tomcat so that you can talk to it from the outside. Um, I mentioned volumes. Each pod has a unique IP address. Um, yeah, I've done that. Let me just show you what a pod looks like. Um, here's a little web console. This is a web console for an open source project I'll talk later called Fabricate. And this is basically looking at an installation of Kubernetes that's running on my laptop. Um, so this is, these are all the pods I'm running right now. So each one of these is a, is a pod. In this example, almost all of the pods are actually just one Docker content. So don't worry about the, the words. They're maybe a bit small for you to read. Um, let me show you an example. Uh, I'm running an Elasticsearch there. Uh, I'm running Grafana. Each one of these are individual processes running on the box. Um, this column here shows the actual Docker um, image name that's running, so you can see the name of the image that, that's running. If you click on that link, it takes you to Docker, Docker's website. One thing about the pods is each pod has its own IP address, which is kind of nice. Um, if you just use Docker, by the way, on your laptop, and you boot up, say, three Tomcats, so you've got three Tomcats, they're all listening on port 8080. Inside the container, the container thinks it's listening to port 8080. But on your laptop, you've only got one port 8080, right? So they can't be really on port 8080. So what Docker does, it, it does port mapping. So it generates usually a dynamic port for each Tomcat. So if you've got your three Tomcats on your laptop and you're trying to figure out which one to talk to, you have to keep looking at what's the magic port for the second Tomcat. It's a complete pain in the, in the bottom. Um, with one thing that's nice about Kubernetes is every pod gets an IP address, and then because every pod has an IP address, all the ports inside that pod are the same. So, for example, every pod running Tomcat would have 8080. Uh, every pod using uh, ActiveMQ might be 616. So it means you don't have to keep looking at port ports, which is really painful if you're just using Docker. So every pod has an IP address. Um, it's telling you which host it's running on. Everything's on my laptop, so it's the same host. Um, a pod can have labels, which we'll talk about that in a minute. The labels are just kind of key value pairs that help you query pods. We'll talk about labels later. Um, this restarts column, by the way, shows uh, a lot of things have been re how many times each container has been restarted. Everything's been restarted because I kind of bounced everything because I shut my laptop down. So that's why everything looks like it's been restarted. Okay, so those are pods, right? Each pod has a Docker image and an IP address, and it's basically a process, and you can start and stop them and so on. Okay, that's pods. Um, the next thing is replication controls. Now, it, this is an example of what the replication controller looks like. It just about fits on the slide. Basically, a replication controller is a blob of uh, JSON. I've used YAML just because it's slightly shorter on the slide. You can use YAML or JSON, it's the same, it's the same. it doesn't really matter. Basically, a, a replication controller um, is a blob of JSON that tells Kubernetes how to make a pod. What Docker image do you want to use? What environment variables do you want to use? What labels do you want to add to your pod? That kind of stuff. So if you see at the bottom, um, you can see that there's, a, there's an environment variable. Um, there's the port. The port, in this case, this is Elasticsearch. And for whatever reason, Elasticsearch uses port 9200. 9, so it's exposing the HTTP port 9200. And then this is the Docker image name. There we go. So like, that's the name of the Docker image to run in the pod. Uh, that's pretty much it. And then there's this magic. Uh, value here, replicas one. Now what a replication controller does is 
a replication controller, you, you take this JSON of YAML and you chuck it into uh, Kubernetes and Kubernetes says thank you. And then it basically watches Kubernetes, it watches itself um, and monitors how many pods are running. And it ensures that at all times there will be one replica, in other words, one instance running. At any point in time, you can change that replica from one to two, to a hundred, to a thousand, to a million, and it will run more or less of each pod to make sure that that contract is valid. So in other words, a replication controller lets you scale your app, right? You put your uh, process in a container, you put it in Kubernetes, then the replication controller lets you scale up or down really, really easily. Let me show you what that looks like. So this is the replication controllers page, and these are the controllers that are controlling the pods, right? In other words, these are the things that are making sure all the pods run. Um, now, I should mention, by the way, in, in Kubernetes, you can just run a pod, right? You can just say, run this pod now, please. And it goes, yeah, okay, and it runs the pod. But just running a pod by itself, at any point in time, that pod could die, right? The, the pod could call dump, the machine could die, the machine could run out of memory, could, uh, the machine it's running on could disconnect from the network. Um, running a pod by hand is a bit like running something on the command line. I mean, it's fine on your laptop when you're just playing around, but if you're really in production, always wrap things in a replication controller because you want to make sure stuff keeps running, right? Well, the main thing about a replication controller is if you say, I want one of these to run and the machine that's running it dies, Kubernetes starts up the same pod on another machine, right? Or if something kills a pod for whatever reason, um, it's immediately restarted elsewhere, right? So um, you can think of replication controller if you've ever done like Linux stuff with uh, init.d and all that kind of stuff. It's a way of, uh, all of, it's a way of, it's a bit like init.d for a cluster or system D for a cluster. It's a way of making sure everything keeps running. And then you can resize things. So if I click on the number of replicas, for in this case, for Fana, and I say, oh, let's have two of these, and I click resize, um, you can see that start there. There we go, we've got two. So now we've got two pods. If I go back to the pods page, uh, and I'll just filter for Grafana, there we go. So I've got two instances. Uh, so one of them started three seconds ago, or 12 seconds ago, well, that's okay. I'm not gonna keep reading on the seconds. Uh, one of them started fairly recently, and the other one started an hour ago. And then if at any point in time you say, yeah, I don't really need two of those, it's not really doing very much, I can scale back down again, so. I think you can scale down to zero or whatnot. So there we go. So with just a couple of clicks, you can scale up or down trivially, right? It's really, really trivial to write your own auto scaler that just calls the system and decides when to scale up or down. Because it's just a little REST API that lets you change the number of replicas at any point in time. So you can write your own magic auto scaler using whatever uh, clever mechanisms you want to do to decide when should you run two or three or a hundred or a thousand or something. So just by having a pod and a replication controller, you can define how many instances of a process are running in a system at any point in time, right? And this stuff works on a laptop, it works on a cluster in your office, it works on your data center, it works in the cloud, it works on Linux, it's just awesome. So we've, this is a way by using a Docker container and a replication controller, we've got a way of ensuring how many instances of something runs, right? Which is really nice. Um, the next part of this, how does everything kind of talk to each other? Um, what I did is I've just booted up um, Kubernetes and I've just run a bunch of stuff. I didn't have to configure anything, I didn't have to SSH into a machine and hack with buys and some text files. Everything just started up and connected uh, with each other. For example, if I show you, oh, I'll come on to um, But everything's basically wired together automatically. Everything's discovered each other. So how does that work? Um, so the next thing is services. So we've got pods, replication control, and services. This is a service definition. Now, services are much smaller. There's not a whole lot to a service definition. What the service is in Kubernetes, I know service is a very overused term. A, a service in Kubernetes is a way of grouping pods together and exposing them on an IP address in a pod. That's really it. So you can think of a service as like a load balance. It's a way of saying, I want to talk to one of the Tomcats or one of the Elasticsearches or one of the Kibanas or Cassandras or whatever. I want to talk to one instance of this thing um, but I don't really care which one. So it's a way of grouping your pods together to make them act as if they're one thing, right? So it's kind of like a load balancer. So in this case, uh, we have a port that we're going to expose. In this case, it's port 80. So this is the service that exposes the rest of the guy of Elasticsearch. Uh, we say what port we want to expose. In this case, port 80. We say the target port. In other words, what's the port in the pod that we're going to talk to? In this case, 9200. Uh, and then what's the selector? And the selector is a bunch of key value pairs to filter on the pods to find which pods to uh, use. <laughs> now, one of the things uh, Kubernetes, I should have mentioned, Kubernetes is based on a Google paper that they just released a couple of months ago uh, called the Borg paper. Most of what Google's done, they've released a research paper describing it, like MapReduce and uh, 
big table and chubby and all those kind of different things. Uh, the Borg paper is really about how Google manages their containers in production. I shouldn't mention all this video, I apologize. So uh, Google has been running containers in, in production. Everything runs in the container at Google, right? Everything. When you do a Google search, it's going through uh, basically Docker containers. Uh, Google's been using containers now for about 10 years. Um, and the way they provision and manage containers internally, they use a system called Borg, which is the precursor to Kubernetes. And so the reason Google did Kubernetes is they wanted everyone else to get the benefit of Kubernetes, and they wanted everyone to, to realize that the way of scaling software working is, is to work in a Kubernetes way. Plus, they knew that they could implement trivially Kubernetes on top of their cloud, right? Um, so the Borg paper um, is, is an interesting read. One of, the, one of the only real changes in Kubernetes from the board, one of the main things that they, they improved on was the added labels, um, which is what the selector is, which is made it really simple to find things and define services. Um, for example, you can do things like uh, uh, blue, green deployments or uh, A-B testing or whatever. You could have two different kinds of service uh, implementation. Let's say I might have two different configurations of Elasticsearch I want to try out. I could use selectors to find both kinds of things. So using selectors, you could kind of query which pods you want to use to expose on the service. Right? So you could use a selector to use the old version of some software or the new version, or both versions of software, right? Because you're just querying with pods. Anyways, so to, to make it a bit more concise, the service is a way of exposing a network connection to a bunch of pods. So if you want to talk to one of your Tomcats, just make a service and now you can talk to any of the Tomcats. Uh, let me show you services in action. So here's all the services I'm running right now. Um, and it shows how many pods uh, are there for each service. In this case, it's one of the um, And a service has a name, um, and, and here's the labels and so forth. And these are the selectors which are used to find the pods for each service. So if I look at, say, the Grafana service, notice it's got an address. So each service has an IP address as well. So just like every pod is given an IP address and given it, each service has an IP address. So there's one IP address and one port to talk to Elasticsearch. So that's kind of cool. So for service discovery type like Kubernetes, all you need to know is what's the service, what's the uh, host name or, or port, what's the host name or IP address and port number to talk to the service. So, so service discovery in Kubernetes is literally looking up uh, two strings and that's it. And then you can talk to any one of the instances of the ports. So one of the other things about services is you can expose external services. Mention. The IP addresses in Kubernetes, the pod and the service IP addresses, are kind of internal to Kubernetes, right? They're not real public IP addresses. They're um, private IP addresses within the cluster. So if you're on your laptop and you're trying to talk to one of these IP addresses, your laptop probably can't see the IP address because it's local to a Kubernetes cluster. So then one other thing you can do with services is expose them as external uh, addresses using a HA proxy low balancer thing. So all of these URLs here, those are actually the external IP addresses, the external load balancer that then talks to the service. So those are external. These ones are internal and have not been exposed externally. Okay. So if I click on the Grafana uh, URL, the Grafana URL opens the, um, is it going to work? Ooh, just about, yay. Um, the Grafana URL is, this is the HTML5 web application that's visualizing all of the metrics that have been collected by the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, one of the apps we have in a Fabricate project that I'll talk about later, um, collects metrics for every single container that's running. Right? So every single container you run, we can collect metrics, we can do the same with logs, um, and store them in, in this case, it's a, da a database called InfluxDB, which is really good for time series data. So we store all of the metrics for all the containers in a database, and then I just clicked on a link then to talk to the service, Grafana, that then talks to InfluxDB. So let me just describe how the service discovery works. Like how does everything actually wire itself up? Um, so just to summarize, if you're gonna write a microservice or an app, um, thank you. Uh, if you want to write an app and run it on uh, Kubernetes, you create a replication controller and usually you want to create a service because most things you want to expose as some kind of network protocol like HTTP. Um, so you tend to write replication controller service. So here's how the service discovery works. Um, if we have a service called foo-bar and we want to talk to it from our Java code, so this could be uh, Cassandra or MySQL or Postgres or Redis or something, whatever it is, any form of networked uh, software. I want to talk to that software. Um, these are the two environment, environment variables you need to worry about. When, when your container is started up, Kubernetes injects these environment variables. So for every service that's running, it defines two environment variables. 
uh, foobar service host and foobar service port, which is the IP address of the uh, to IP address and the port number of each service. So if you're writing some Java code and you want to talk to anything at all, you just have to load two environment variables and you can talk to that server, which is just amazing, right? You don't have to do any UDDI weird, weird crap. Um, you don't have to, you'd have to embed something like Zookeeper or call some magic REST API or do anything kind of weird. It's two environment variables for the service, which is really, really simple. So, that, I mean, that's really lovely. I mean, this makes service discovery trivial. Really. This is a, a beautiful thing. How it actually works under the covers is kind of cool. Um, Every machine that's running Kubernetes has this little daemon on the box that stats and stops containers and whatnot. And in that little daemon, when you start talking to a service IP address, um, Kubernetes is using like IP table hooks that it basically starts a little called the kubelet proxy. It's basically a little proxy on the same machine that does the load balancing for you. So there's a tiny little process that runs on every machine that's like your personal load balancer. So each machine that's running Kubernetes gets its own little load balancer that, you, that your process talks over local sockets to it, so there's no actual networking, and then it does the networking to the pods. Then this single little load balancer um, watches all of the pods that are running, sees when a pod comes and goes, and has an in-memory list of all of the IP addresses of the pods. And so every time a socket comes in, it connects to one of the pods. If you kill a pod, it then just reconnects to another pod. So you have, whoa, so you have automatic load balancing for all of your network services baked in, right? So you have scaling with replication controllers, Services let you talk to things and you have load balancing and discovery wired in. If ever you tried to make a distributed system with lots of containers before, this fixes everything. This is amazing, right? Load balancing baked in, discovery baked in. And the thing I find the most amazing thing about Kubernetes is it's all in invisible, apart from two environment variables. So all you need to worry about is two environment variables and a bit of JSON, and that's it. Well, I'm putting things in Docker containers. Um, so this, this stuff is amazing. So the three subatomic particles, remember, pods, are the things you put Docker containers in and you might write some environment variables. Uh, replication controllers are the things that replicate the pods or create a certain number of replicas. Um, so you define how many instances of everything you want to run, basically. And at any point in time, you can change those up and down uh, and services. That's kind of it. So those three things and you're good to go. And then the environment variables for service discovery. Um, so that's kind of, in a, in a nutshell, all you, as a developer, all you need to worry about with Kubernetes, or all you should not worry about. There's nothing to worry about. Those are the things you need to know, right? Um, pods, replication controls, and services. Um, now I'd like to, uh, yeah. So you write some code, you put it in a Docker image, uh, you create some Kubernetes metadata, and you apply it, and you're done, really. Um, let me now switch gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about another open source project called Fabricate, which is something I work on quite a bit, well, mostly, to be honest. Um, so Fabricate is quite a complicated project to describe, because it does quite a lot of stuff. Uh, here's lots of stuff it does. So Fabricate is really um, a bunch of microservices that runs on top of uh, Kubernetes. A lot of it's Java, um, but it's basically stuff to help you as a Java developer use Kubernetes. Uh, so what does, Kubernetes, what does Fabricate do? do? Um, it has tools to help you manage your software. For example, doing um, collecting metrics and storing metrics and visualizing metrics, doing the same for the logs of every single JVM. You get metrics for everything, you get logs for everything, and they're all searchable, and yada, yada, yada. Um, a continuous delivery system, which is really amazing. So in one click, you can just create a project. It will automatically create the Git repository, the Jenkins builds, uh, you've got chat integration, which is really quite sweet. Um, in fact, let me just show you the chat integration now, because it's, it's awesome. Um, do you remember I just resized those pods? We've got a chat built in so you can have a chat server so you can just log into the chat. Whenever anything changes in Kubernetes, we have a chat bot that tells the chat room that it's just started or stopped a pod. Um, it's got two entries here because I test this works just before my talk started. Um, so here you can see I started and stopped the pod. Do you remember I want to resize things up and down? So in other words, we have a chat bot that will tell you when Kubernetes is resizing things. So you can just hang out in the chat room and watch what Kubernetes is doing, which is kind of nice. And then when builds happen, um, okay, so we have continuous delivery, which basically just means it quicker and easier for you to use, uh, set up a project with the source control and the webhooks with Jenkins and the uh, code review with Garrett and SolarCube and chat and issue tracking and all that kind of stuff. It just works out the box. It's really, really simple. An iPaaS is the thing we mostly focus on and where, where this project kind of came from, uh, which is a long word, which means integration platform as a service. So it's basically taking things like Apache Camel for integration and IPMQ for messaging uh, and API management and all of those kinds of bits of open source 
and turning it basically into an appliance that just works. Right? So you don't have to um, understand how to scale uh, Active MQ or understand how to scale Camel. It just kind of works as an appliance. Um, Klaus, I thought he's going to do a talk uh, this afternoon on uh, using Camel on Kubernetes and stuff like that. Uh, with some awesome demos, I think. Uh, so if you want to know about that, go to Klaus's talk. And then Rob is going to do a talk on Active MQ again on uh, Kubernetes. So hopefully demoing Active MQ. Uh, okay, I'll do a big choice of a demo there. Um, so if you want to go to those talks, those are later this afternoon. Um, so that's the iPad bit. The bit I want to talk about now is the Java tools. In other words, tools for Java developers if you want to take more advantage of Kubernetes. So um, there's a whole bunch of, there's quite a lot of different Java tools. Um, the main one I want to start with is the Maven tooling. So as a Java developer, if you have a Maven project right now and you want to take that Maven project and run it on Kubernetes, there's basically three commands you need to type. Um, don't worry about being able to read the text, I shouldn't be that big. Um, there's Maven Docker build, uses a Maven Docker plugin, which basically makes a Docker container image for your project. All it really does is take a base Docker image, take your artifacts, like your jars, copy them into the Maven directory in the, in the container image, and you're done. You've got a Docker image built. Then Maven Fabricate JSON generates the JSON file for Kubernetes for your project. So it basically makes a replication control and a service for you. <coughs> and then Maven Fabricate Apply takes the JSON file it's made and applies it into Kubernetes. So in those three commands, you've made the Docker image, you've made the Kubernetes JSON, and then you've applied it into Kubernetes, and your app just runs, which I think you're going to demo class. So there's going to be a demo of doing this later today in class and stuff if you want to see that happening. So it's three commands, nice and simple, right? So it just looks like Maven's doing all this magic stuff, but really it's Kubernetes under the covers, is applying the JSON and using the Docker that's a Maven plugin. If you're a Spring or CDI person um, and you want to do service discovery, this is a, a kind of a CDI or Spring way of, of discovering services. But right? we like our annotations in Java. Um, we sometimes have slightly too many annotations, but anyways, we like our annotations. This is a way of using annotations to inject a service. So if you want to talk to a JDBC or a, a Elasticsearch or whatever it is, you can use an annotation in your code at inject to do the injection in Spring or in CDI, and then if you use at service name, the service name is, is an annotation from the Fabricate project, at service name, and then you give it the name of the service, what that does under the covers is that will then use the environment variables to make the URL from the two environment variables, two environment variables in, um, in Kubernetes. It's slightly more clever than that though, because sometimes you want to run stuff on your laptop, and your laptop isn't in Kubernetes, so your laptop doesn't have the environment variables that Kubernetes would define. So one of the nice things about the CDI injection is if the environment variables aren't defined, it will connect over the REST API to Kubernetes and find the service anyways and then connect to it. So the annotation is kind of more developer-centric, but it works on your laptop when you're outside of Kubernetes, which is kind of nice. A um, couple of other details. The second uh, example shows how you can specify explicitly I want a HTTP URL. And the very last one, you don't really need to do this very much, but the very last example, if ever you wanted to write your own custom load balancer, which very few people ever need to do that, but if you wanted to write your own custom load balancer, in other words, you wanted to know at any point in time what's the URL to every pod that's running something, this last example injects a dynamic list that changes in real time of all the actual endpoints of a service. So the last one is saying, tell me basically what are the pod endpoints for a service. So rather than talking to the service URL that then does the load balancing for you, this one lets you inject the actual implementations of the pods, right, which is nice. Um, I should have mentioned before, by the way, uh, the Maven tooling and the CDI stuff uses a library called Kubernetes API, which is just a Java API to Kubernetes. So if you ever, ever want to write in Java code to query pods or query services or play around with replication controllers or whatever it is, um, it's a trivial couple of lines of Java code to do all that, because there's a REST API in Kubernetes, which is really simple. And you can watch things too, which is kind of cool. Um, the, if you notice the console, when I, um, when I scale things, like let's say, let's run three, um, the console updates pretty near instantly as things happen, right? Um, that's happening because the console is using WebSockets to listen to Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, you can watch using a WebSocket anything that's running in Kubernetes. You can watch the services, the pods, uh, the replication controller, so as soon as something changes, you can be notified instantly, which is really, really nice. Um, okay, so that's injection with uh, annotations in CDI or Spring. 
Um, integration testing, now you, you're certainly not going to read this slide, uh, I apologize. The, the aim isn't for you to read the code so much. Um, one thing you need to do with, with anything, really, is test something in a real environment. Right? Something might totally work on your laptop, but it might not work in production, right? Because it could be a slightly different environment, and things might be set up in a different way. So what you really need to do is integration testing. Of testing, really, the Java code I've just written in the Docker container on Kubernetes with the other things in Kubernetes that you're going to use, right? So use the real Elasticsearch and the real database and the real whatever it is. Um, so you want to do integration testing, which is testing in the real Docker images, right? Uh, there's a, a plugin in Fabricate called for Archelion, um, which Archelion is a project that's started around doing in-container testing, as in in-app server testing. So how to test the war inside Tomcat, or test the war inside JBoss application server. Um, what we've done on the Fabricate team is extend Archelion to add a plugin for Kubernetes. So what this, what this what this Java code basically does is it defines an integration test that provisions an ActiveMQ broker, a producer, and a consumer. It spins up a brand new namespace in Kubernetes. I've not mentioned namespaces yet. I should, I'm going to do it now. Um, a namespace in Kubernetes is a way of segmenting things, right? Um, you might want to have a production namespace and a testing namespace, right? And you might want an individual namespace for yourself to play around, and then another namespace for your team to work together. Namespaces are just kind of groups to segment things. Um, what you kind of don't want to do is accidentally talk to the production database when you're writing an integration test, right? You want to keep things separate. So uh, namespaces are the way that Kubernetes does this, that you can have different apps in different namespaces, and all the service discovery and all that kind of stuff, you only see services in the same namespace, right? So you can, you can relax that you don't accidentally start deleting data in production. And all that kind of stuff. So what the integration testing does, which is really cool, is it spins up a brand new namespace in Kubernetes, so it's a new environment, if you like, a new cloud. It spins up a new namespace in Kubernetes, provisions all of the Docker containers that are required using replication controllers, and waits for them to start up and asserts that they all start up correctly. And then the last, uh, the last three lines of code then uses JMX to then query the MVs running in the containers to assert that the code did what you expected. Um, there's a library called Jolokia, J-O-L-O-K-I-E which we bake into all of our software, it's awesome. Uh, Jolokia exposes JMX in the JVM over REST, so it provides a nice REST JSON way of looking at JMX. If, how many people have like used JMX, like the Java API of JMX? Okay, it's really sucky, isn't it? It's horrible, it's one of the worst Java APIs I think I've ever used, it's really horrible. And I used to kind of detest JMX with a passion, it's kind of a hicky API. Now Jolokia makes it all cool and hipster, right? Because it's just like REST and JSON, and it seems really cool. So if you use Jolokia, suddenly you'll begin to love JMX again. It seems really nice. So what this code does is it uses the Jolokia REST API. So it's making REST calls into the pods to query some various JMX stats. And in this case, to assert that, um, uh, I'll read the code for you. It asserts that a, a consumer consumes enough messages and that uh, the NQ and the DQ counts in the message broker in So in other words, we're testing from the outside uh, what's running in Kubernetes by just doing a, a couple of simple lines of Java code. Pretty awesome stuff. So integration is, is important, um, and uh, Archelion is really good for that in Kubernetes. Uh, oh, I think that's it. Um, how, how long have we got left? Five minutes. Oh, okay. Let me uh, let me do some demos or something then. Uh, okay. By the way, any questions so far about anything Kubernetes? So there's Docker containers. Um, you make images. Uh, create some JSON for the services and the replication controllers, and you've got some environment variables. It's really, really simple. It's a Java developer, it's nice and simple. Any questions? No? That was all totally clear? Everybody gets it? That's awesome. So services are blocked JSON, does load balancing, replication controller scales up and down, and Doc is awesome too. Okay, well let me just do some demos. Um, it's it's really not work. Uh, so, this console, by the way, is part of the Fabricate project. It's a Fabricate console. It's written in a, uh, it's all HTML5, uh, AngularJS. It's basically static HTML that's talking to the Kubernetes REST API with the covers. Um, I've shown you the services and the controllers and the pods. Um, this is the apps page that tries to uh, uh, group everything together into one page. So, typically, people think of apps like I'm running Elasticsearch or I'm running Cassandra. 
And there's often several things in an app, right? An app might have multiple pods, it might have a service, it might have a replication controller. So in Kubernetes terms, there's a bunch of things for an app. So this, this console tries to unify apps together. So we're running a bunch of things. Uh, then if we click the run button, this shows you all the various things that we can run. Um, I'll run an item key broker. Um, shall I do your demo now? No. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll do that. Um, and I won't do a quick start. Uh, okay. So I could run all kinds of different things. Uh, let me just run the API management stuff, even though I've never tried it. And then we'll see at the bottom. Uh, or the, there we go. Uh, you see it's starting to deploy here. So if I look on the pods page, we'll see the pods downloading. And what it's doing now is, I've never run this on my laptop before, so it's, it's pulling from the uh, public Docker registry uh, this Docker image, which is going to be taking a little while, I'm not sure what the Wi-Fi's like here. Um, yeah, I, I got excited and I thought I'd done it. Um, so it might take a little while for that to happen. Um, oh, that's a good question. What does the API man do? Uh, so if, ah, that's a really good question. Let me think of a good answer. Uh, <laughs> So an increasingly common thing people have with APIs is you want to manage them. <laughs> uh, okay, so what often people do is you make an, a, an API like a REST API or a SOAP API or something, and you want to give that API to other teams, other com companies, other uh, systems and whatnot, and you often want to put a contract around it. For example, um, people on the internet can uh, invoke this REST API 10 times a minute but if you're a gold customer, you can invoke it a million times a minute. Or you, you might want to have SLAs around it, security around it, uh, access control around it, and so forth. So API management is around wrapping REST APIs uh, behind a contract that you can then atta attach policies to, like give people keys and tokens and whatever. So it's, it's part access control, and it's part SLAs, uh, and it's part contractual. So if you were putting a REST API on the internet, for example, and you had certain partners who were allowed to use different APIs, you kind of need something like an API management so that you can publish REST APIs and be able to manage who gets access to what APIs at what time. Okay. So that's API management. Oh, oh my god, it started. That's awesome. Okay, so it started. I have no idea what it does. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, let me look inside. One of the nice things about the, uh, the Fabricate console is because we've got Jalocky inside everything that's running, you can look inside the JVM. So any JVM that's running, let me do that again. I'll do that a bit quick. Um, let me go back. When you're looking at the pods page, um, if there's a if one of the pods has a JVM inside that's running Jalokia, you get this little icon there. If you can't, if you forget where the icon is, if you just click on the pod, you get like a big connect button there. So if I click on the connect button, it basically opens another version of the Hotio console. Um, that's looking inside the JVM. So now I'm looking inside the JMX beans, inside the JVM, inside the Docker container, inside Kubernetes. Right? Simple, right? So basically I'm just looking inside the JVM, right? So I'm looking at the JVM so I can look at, say, the, uh, the operating system metrics and all that kind of stuff. So you can look inside anything in JMX, right? Uh, you can just dive in, have a little look around, see how the garbage collector is going, and all that kind of stuff. So you can just live at runtime look inside stuff and see it running. Uh, Klaus will do a much de better demo of, uh, this afternoon where I'll show looking inside the JVM that's running Apache Camel and you can look at the routes and all sorts of awesome things. Um, so there we go. I didn't really talk about things like rolling upgrades and stuff like that. Um, some of the things that are coming uh, uh, along in Kubernetes allow basically, Google's figured out how to do containers really well, right? They run everything in the container, they're always rolling things out in containers and rolling things forwards and backwards and all this kind of stuff. So increasingly, Kubernetes is doing more and more of the stuff that normally you do by hand. Uh, for example, rolling upgrades. If you want to do a rolling upgrade, you've got a new version of some software. So I've got version one and version two. Now the old way of doing it is you take down version one and then you bring up version two. But that kind of sucks because people have got like, re web requests going on version one and you'll, you'll have failed sockets and all sorts of problems. But you know, some people do that. A slightly better way is you run some of version two with version one at the same time. And you get your low balancer to load the low balance across version one and version two. Um, so that kind of rolling upgrade, where you start rolling out the new version while the old version is running, is pretty popular now. One of the nice things is you can leave them both running and look at your metrics and look at your log and check. Like I might have ten Tomcats using version one and one Tomcat using version two. Is the, is this one okay as it started up? Okay, that's good. Uh, any exceptions in the log? No, that's good. 
Let's leave it a few minutes. Is it still up? Yeah, that's good. You could leave it for maybe 10 minutes, maybe an hour. Um, send some traffic, it's weird, a low bounce will send some traffic. And then gradually you can scale up the new version and you can scale down the old version. And then when you're happy, you can just kill the old version. Now Kubernetes has a rolling upgrade mechanism built in. You can just say rolling upgrade from this version to this version in this amount of time, and it just kind of does it for you. Or you can just manually do it. Now how it basically works is you create a new replication controller for the new version, right? So you have one replication controller for the old version and one replication controller for the new version, and then you can scale them manually up and down however you like, right? So you can start the new version, do you like it? Yes, run more of them, and then when you're happy, scale down the old version. So rolling upgrades is really, really simple with Kubernetes. Um, one of the reasons that selectors are kind of cool is that you can use selectors to expose services for different groups. So that you could, for example, um, have a service that uses the old and the new version. So you're, you're load balancing over both versions. And if you really want, you could just use the new version and just use the old version by just changing your selector. So that's rolling upgrades. Uh, is there anything else I should mention? Namespaces. Security is built into the namespaces so, so different people can see different namespaces. Uh, yeah, I think I'm done. Uh, any questions? No? Thanks, you, Jordi. When you click on that run button, we saw a list of pods. These applications. Is there a repository of pods? Is there something you can query saying, okay, what's pods are available? What pods or what things are available to run? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me show you that. So this run screen, what this run screen is doing under the covers. Okay, I should step back. There's something in uh, there's an extension to Kubernetes in, a, in the OpenShift project right now, which is hopefully going to be pushed up to Kubernetes soon called templates. And templates are um, a way of, they're basically, a template is a blob of JSON for, so it could be services, it could be replication controllers that have some dollar squigglies in them. Um, so that you can, uh, that as you're about to run them, you can substitute some environment variables and some expressions. So for example, uh, when I, if I choose to run, um, say the active key broker, no, the metric server, uh, no, no, no. Um, you see these uh, uh, fields that it asks you to fill in, these are parameters in the template that it asks you to fill in before you run them. Now these templates are just in the REST API of Kubernetes. You can query using the REST API, using the command line tool, what are the templates that are in Kubernetes right now. Um, let me show you in the terminal. Um, there's a command line. Let me scoot again. Uh, you can type get pods to get a list of the pods. Uh, and you can say get templates to get a list of all the templates. So each one of these is a template. In other words, it's a blob of JSON that you can run at any point in time. And you can add and remove these at any point in time by the command line. You can do OC space create, or you can drag and drop them. Um, I should have set up the demo to demo that. One of the nice things about the console is you can just find the blob of JSON and drag and drop it onto this page to run it. I should demo that, shouldn't I? Uh, that one. So here's a diagram, I should have done this, shouldn't I? I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm running a, a reasonable amount of stuff at the minute. This diagram shows um, on, the, on that side the replication controllers and on this side the services. Um, so there's all the services that are defined right now and it's showing you which service talks to which pod. So if I look at, say, um, the Grafana, Grafana one, uh, no, that's Heapster, sorry, Heapster. So Heapster here, you can see the replication controller is that pod, and then this is the service it's using. So you can basically see how the services and the replication controllers are related to each other, which is kind of nice. Uh, we can look at all of the hosts. Now in this case, everything is on, on my host, but if you have multiple hosts, you can see what are the pods on each host, and what's the IP address of the host, and the pods, and so on and so forth. And we can look at the real-time metrics. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here all day if you have any other questions, come and grab me and uh, we'll have a beverage. <laughs>